welcome back to another video thanks for tuning in gonna walk you around and show you some things as we're continuing to move into spring chicks are about to go out on the pasture we've been planting trees we have healthy fresh lambs that are adapting to their new life and just gonna walk around a bit <clears throat> on this Saturday afternoon and show you what's going on on the farm please like the video and leave a comment and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already we're going to be regularly posting updates as we move into season two at wild east and are excited to have you along for the ride some of the first spring ephemerals that come up around here, rue anemone. They can almost always be found along drainages and it's a very delicate, beautiful little wildflower that calls in the rest of them. I think we're grateful for whoever planted these ornamental crab apple trees in front of the house. They don't produce quality fruit really for us or the birds don't seem to enjoy them either but we get this beautiful blossoming in late March every year and you can't hear it on a day like today because it's a bit windy but you can stand under these trees and hear all the insects buzzing around and they're extremely fragrant as well so they call us up to the house at the end of a good day's work and they're absolutely beautiful some of the first trees to flower out on the farm in the spring First batch of chicks looking good. They're going out on Monday. Today is Saturday. So just a couple more days in the brooder. We have some cold tonight and it was wet. So they could go out as soon as now if the weather was right, but we're holding off until there's a nice window, but looking real healthy, happy with the new brooder set up. The biggest cost in the broiler enterprise is feed and we buy organic feed so even more so and we're really happy to have gotten a grant to purchase these two mobile grain bins uh, folks sometimes call these gravity wagons and we're going to be stationing these as little feed stations out in the pasture and we can move them around the edges of the pasture with the tractor and feed funnels out of this tube here. We're gonna be doing some modifications to fit our context, <clears throat> but rather than getting bulk two ton, or sorry, one ton, 2000 pound totes of feed, we're gonna be getting feed delivered in a grain truck and siloed into these, which is gonna cut our costs by about $50 a ton, which may not sound like a lot, but it adds up significantly over the course of a season and even more so as we continue to scale up the animal enterprises on the farm. So I'll be documenting some of the modifications we make and how these work out, but these are essentially just grain silos on running gear that you can move across the pasture or across the farm easily and opens us up to be flexible. We may get stationary silos in the future, but for now, this is going to work quite well. So in many of our beds, we install them with wood chips level to the paths. But in this being the wettest spot in any of the gardens, we decided to dig out the wood chips and turn these into raised beds because we were having drainage issues and issues with chips getting in the paths but we're seeing now it rained really hard last night already an improvement in the condition of the beds they're draining much better and the paths as you can see are staying a little wetter than other parts of the gardens but hopeful that we can remediate some of the moisture issues and it's really just these four or five beds by making them raised beds we've got salad greens and arugula asian mix all coming up really nicely in here 
recovering on some of these cold spring nights. It's pretty typical in our climate to have a pretty wild March weather-wise. We'll have 70 degree days and 25 degree nights and pretty heavy winds that come through. So trying to figure out in the second season what the earliest planting window that makes sense for our outside beds are and trialing with that we had some frost damage on Monday night uh, got down into the low 20s tunnels looking very nice got a mix of things coming in this spring we're going to be planting tomatoes and cucumbers in the three tunnels over the summer in these middle two beds and running drip irrigation with kale plants growing on the side. You see some of the damage that happened. We had to pull plants out. Fortunately, we have some extras to replace them, but this tunnel actually endured a nice little wind mini disaster <clears throat> a couple weeks ago where we had, you remember in the last video, the broiler pens parked next to it and we got really intense gusts that blew two of the lighter structures into this tunnel and it damaged some of the metal pretty good and utterly splintered the broiler pins. So we're fortunate to be able to post a GoFundMe to help cover some of those costs and receive really good community support to cover the costs of repairing the tunnel, which is back in full function and building out new chicken tractors. Work in progress, rebuilding the splintered chicken tractors. We elected to go ahead and double the dimensions on the Salatin pens, which traditionally call for a one by lumber to make it as light as possible for the traditional dolly style movement. You couldn't move one like this easily with the traditional model uh, just because it is so heavy but as you may have seen in the last video we're vaulting them up onto bike wheels using eight inch bolts to <clears throat> be the axle for the tires and even with this heavier lumber and the roofing that's going to go on they move quite easily with one person, uh, two people, perhaps in some scenarios, if you're going to land. But I feel very confident that these are gonna last a very long time. We've bolted every piece together. And yeah, these are coming along nice. The traditional Salatin pen is a beautiful design that's worked for a lot of folks, but it has its limitations in particular getting high quality, one inch dimensional lumber that we've experienced just not being up to snuff in terms of quality these days. A lot of the boards when we were building the first ones would snap in half as we were putting them through the table saw and you just don't see that with the two by lumber. It's all pressure treated and we feel confident that in going this route these pens are going to last at least five years, hopefully longer, with minimal to no upkeep and repair. In addition to the bolts, we used heavy duty lag screws where appropriate. And yeah, we'll keep you updated. We have two more pens out in the field for the first batch that are made of the one by. They're the ones that didn't get blown away in the wind. And so we'll see over the course of this year and, and perhaps next how much better these hold up to the daily wear and tear that comes from moving them as often as we do. All the moms have had their babies. We bred five ewes back in September and over the last month they've been coming in, the little lambs, and they're just having such a great time adjusting to life on this pasture. We had our last two born out of our youngest mom right there this past week, two little rams, and on the whole ended up with 10 little lambs. Uh, six of them are 
ewes or females and four of them are little baby rams and as you can see they're bouncy as they get right now these two are the most recently born just learning the ropes just a couple days old mom's taking good care of them We've been planting more trees and shrubs around the farm this spring and haven't taken the time to film the process so much because I've been so in it, but I'll walk you around and show you some of the things that we've done to intensify and improve some of the perennial plantings. A big part of the maintenance in establishing these perennial systems is annual deep mulch to keep the weeds down and to create a fungally dominant ecosystem in the soil for the woody stuff to establish. This is our basket willow planting. You can see are starting to leaf out and have grown some of them three or four feet last year. I think after establishing during last season they'll put on a lot of growth and might get a first harvest or at least our first coppicing of these basket willows next winter in February or so. Some of the pear trees starting to flower out. This is Korean giant, nice Asian pear. In Northfield, we went through, we had very lo low mortality in Northfield from our first year only about 5%, but in the areas where some of the trees and shrubs didn't survive, we went through and replaced them with red mulberry and service berry and wild plum to get some vigorous growing native perennials that, that bear nice fruits on them. So we're excited about that. We also went through in some areas and our original pattern is having trees planted on 12 and a half foot spacing and we're experimenting with intensifying that spacing a bit putting trees in between that 12 and a half foot spacing at six and a quarter so watching the, how biointensive we can get here's an example of a little wild plum planted between a hazel and a chestnut tree there so if that works out well we, we may very well continue intensifying the spacing and trying to fit as many plants into this young silver pasture as we can this is a fun experimental zone over here on the farm kind of in the back uh, southwest corner of things we've gone through and planted black locust at five foot spacing and borrowed the no-till drill from the county soil and water you can see this cover crop coming up we sowed a mix of oats and peas in between the rows of locusts and the notion here is that we're gonna crimp down this cover crop in may once it's fully covering the soil and plant winter squash directly into that. We don't have space in our small no-till market gardens to grow winter squash economically, but the soil back in here is, is an excellent sandy loam. The creek is right there, so it's just about the lowest part of our floodplain. And we're hoping that we can <coughs> utilize this method of direct seeding cover crop <coughs> and crimping it down annually so that we can get a longer term, broader scale no-till approach to growing winter squash amongst the locusts as they establish until they're shading out too much. So keep you updated on this project. We're really excited. We're growing Tetsu Kabocha as the main type of winter squash in here. And we're gonna be interplanting that with some acorn and spaghetti and butternut as well. So yeah. I'll keep you updated on how this evolves over time.
in here, we've planted a privacy barrier that's primarily hybrid willows, interplanted every fourth willow with a wild plum, which are vigorous fruit producing natives. And a big reason is creating a boundary between us and this nursery operation next door, both for privacy and to guard our pastures from some of the spraying that is done over here. So the idea with the hybrid willows and the plums is they're very fast growing, vigorous trees that will create a nice barrier in a matter of several years. We attempted growing the willows last year by just taking the key lime plow and planting them right into the rips. But as vigorous as these little hybrid willows can be, they don't compete well with grass early on. So we laid out some landscape fabric and planted straight into that to help keep the competition down. Down in this drainage that runs through the center of the farm more or less. And prior to us, it had been managed with spraying and mowing right up to the edge and we're letting it go back wild. And it's been a pleasure in just a year to watch it turn into a lively, perennially flowing little wetland ecosystem. We have additional smaller drainages around the farm uh, that were dug out prior to us getting here. And the bird life and the amphibian life has been incredible this spring. We can come out on warm mornings and warm nights and watch and listen to hundreds if not thousands of frogs that are emerging and finding little egg packets that they're laying in these wet areas and really feel excited about turning these into perennial wetlands. Something that a farmer friend of mine mentioned when looking at some of our ditches that are really close to the gardens is how little drainages like this harbor habitat for predatory spiders, which are very beneficial in a garden setting. And some people actually will intentionally dig drainages close to their garden or their, their vegetable production in part for that purpose. And so we feel really fortunate to have that already in place. And it's amazing as we are doing a bunch of transplanting and bed flipping this spring to see the number of spiders that are in our beds and you know, being organic and small scale, trying to lean more and more towards always trying to figure out the least input intensive methods for pest protection that we can do. And if these little drainages can harbor healthy ha uh, populations of spiders. Thanks for tuning in to another video. Sorry for the wind today, but doing low budget videos and just documenting what we're doing that may sometimes be part of it before we invest in better audio equipment and stuff. So hope that you got something out of that and stay tuned for future updates on the season. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.